The O Cannabis Conference and Expo returns to Toronto June 1st through the 3rd, and there's still some good booth locations available. This exciting event is free for cannabis retailers, and will feature Tommy Chong receiving a Lifetime Achievement Award at the O Cannabis Industry Awards. For more information about exhibiting or to register to attend, go to ocannabis.com. That's O-C-A-N-N-A-B-I-Z.com. Welcome back to The Talking Hedge. I'm Josh Kincaid, Capital Markets Analyst and host of your Cannabis Business Podcast. Today, we're going to do a financial market update. Market's moving fast, so let's take a look and see what's happening. NASDAQ's green for the year, so what crisis? It only took the Fed's $2 trillion dollars in balance sheet expansion in four weeks. So it's all good, right? So you can see from this graph that the Federal Reserve has increased its balance sheet by 2.6 billion since August, 2019. That's a 70% increase in just eight months. And then the Fed's balance sheet expansion of 2 trillion in the past four weeks represents over 9% of gross domestic product. So you're seeing the US equity prices once again valued at 132% of GDP as the tech sector is again green for the year, while the entire economic structure is collapsing around us. You have economic activity falling to levels worse than 2009. New York Fed is projecting a second quarter GDP of negative 7.8, might get as much as 30%. We have 30 million people that have filed for unemployment and we don't even have a supply chain disruption yet. So in just a couple of quick charts, you can see here from the advanced retail sales, clothing and everything just kind of absolutely plummeting down to uh, 95, 1995 levels. The M1 money supply, meanwhile, is skyrocketing. That's uh, demand deposit accounts, cash, coin, cash equivalents, and loans also skyrocketing. So I mentioned that the ratio of total market cap to US GDP is about 132%. And that's consolidated into just a five stocks. So you can see this higher concentration is more than the 1999.com uh, collapse with Microsoft and GE, Cisco, Intel, Walmart being the, the top five companies. Then now you're seeing Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, Alphabet, and Facebook being the major consolidators. We can see here from the Federal Reserve's economic data that the continued insurance unemployment claims are skyrocketing. We'll end up with 30 million claims easily surpassing that of the last recession. So there's obviously a dichotomy between what's happening on Main Street and Wall Street. We're going to try and cover that here as well as in future podcasts. But talking about how machines are the only ones that are buying stock right now, humans, humans aren't doing much of anything. All right, so one of the trends that are interesting to point out is that some of the buying patterns that are led by the trend following algos also include short coverings. So it looks like some of the Purchasing decisions on some of these algos are taking some more risk, looking at some equities instead of debt. And so some of that risk parity funds buying equities simply as a default alternative to a high yield bond. Let's look at a much better gauge of what's going on, more of a leading economic indicator, the U.S. consumer spending, which collapsed most on record. So in addition to having spending drop 7.3%, the most ever on record, we also saw that incomes dropped most since January 2013, which was a 3.1% decrease in wages and salaries. So we're seeing the largest annual contraction in U.S. spending ever. It's larger than the peak of the Lehman crisis. So Americans are obviously living within their means. Savings rates are exploding from 8% to 13% of, this, of disposable income, the highest since 1975. This is the largest contraction in U.S. spending ever, larger than the peak of the Lehman crisis. So Americans are living within their means like never before, which can be seen in the savings rate exploding from 8% to 13% of disposable income, which is the highest since 1975. So we've already mentioned before on a previous podcast about how there was a, a housing expectation that a third of all rent would not be paid. Commercial real estate, um, we're already seeing that. And so that's going to be a trickle down effect when the paper markets uh, don't really discern between commercial and residential. So eventually we're going to see a decline. Uh, we're seeing a lot of other bubbles pop as well. Uh, we'll see housing Here's uh, an example of the auto loan bubble that's about to explode. So in another leading economic indicator, we're seeing subprime car buyers missing loan payments. With unemployment soaring, we can kind of infer from that that maybe borrowers are putting those payments or reallocating those resources. Ally Financial reported that about 25% of its auto loan consumers are taking advantage of its payment deferral program. With everybody staying at home, they're not driving as much, but forbearance could be a huge issue if they have to make those payments up in the end. But not driving means not using oil. It all has downward consequences. 
So we're seeing that there are 27 tankers that are anchored off California and there's hundreds off Singapore as the oil industry is shutting down. This is in response to producers like Saudi Arabia and Russia continuing to produce oil and then May futures, those prices coming down to $37 negative, meaning that the producers would have to pay people to store it. So they're literally running out of places to store oil. So as we're seeing storage starting to fill up, traders are resorting to ocean going tankers to store crude in the hopes of better prices ahead. So siloing it out in the middle of the ocean. So this is obviously taking away a lot of shipping containers. And so those shipping prices are now surging to parabolic levels as the industry is running out of tankers, a sign of just how distorted the market has become. So according to Goldman Sachs, and in as little as three weeks, we're literally going to have no place on earth left to store oil unless oil producers want to pay buyers to hold that oil. So with the plunge in oil prices, we're seeing some of these shale companies just absolutely collapse totally expect to see some consolidation. You'll see a lot of petrol and, and gas companies consolidate. One of the best indicators of how the shale industry is reacting to that collapse is the number of oil rigs in operation. So last week that fell to a four-year low. Before the Rona virus, oil companies ran about 650 rigs in the U.S., but by Friday, more than 40% of them had stopped working with only 378. So bringing that up because there's a delay between the total U.S. oil production and the rig count. So now it's obvious that the U.S. oil production is set to collapse next. So the expectation is to see a lot of other companies reacting to negative prices. So you can see output in Texas and New Mexico, North Dakota and other states now falling as much faster than expected. So there is a theme or a pattern here emerging where we're going to show where there's a potential collapse as we've had almost an entire rebound of the collapse. And so not healthy. It's been much overbought, um, way too optimistic. And so Bank of America is convinced of another market crash. So with the volatility index futures trading above 30, suggesting that the expectations that the bear market is likely not over. U.S. equities are in a bear market rally and they're likely to retest the lows before full recovery as supported by strong historical evidence. And we've seen that rebound in the S&P right here. We're only 10% away from, from the all-time high. You go to the Dow Jones, we're only 15% away from a new high. And then with the NASDAQ, we're only 1.5% away from a new all-time high. So we have already come back to the new all-time highs. So I've outlined how algorithms are essentially buying this market. They're very optimistic, uh, but it's not the real world. So we're already seeing here that the euro has devalued 85% against gold. So taking a look at what you can actually buy, what's happening with the purchasing power, I think we're being kind of distracted by numbers on the stock market, when in reality, things are different. In 1999, the price of gold in euros was $7.88 per gram, but now it's 51 euros per gram. So over the course of 20 years, the price of gold in euros has increased 555%. So unpacking that a little bit, in 1999, it took 0.13 grams to buy one euro. Today, it only takes 0.02 grams. So that's an 85% reduction in purchasing power versus gold. Gold, on the other hand, has had its purchasing power increase in the Eurozone since 99, meaning that the price of gold has outpaced consumer prices. So from this index number, you can see that the gold's purchasing power on average has increased by a staggering 350% over the last 20 years. So we've also mentioned that the spot price versus physical price is much different. Silver, for example, an ounce of silver uh, might be 15 to 17 spot price. Physical is going to be as low as 22, as high as $30. So you're seeing some gold getting smashed out there. So for at least five days in a row, gold has been smashed uh, with heavy volume in the pre-U.S. equity market open. So that's over 15,000 contracts that were pushed through in just a couple of minutes with 8,500 on the downside. That's about $1.5 billion worth. Silver is not immune. It's also getting smashed. And I know some of you guys like some Bitcoin. So throwing that in there, you can see that Bitcoin soared higher in the last few days playing catch up to gold. Uh, versus the sell everything move that we saw in March. So it looks like Bitcoin is still somewhat coupled to gold, but I like that that physical, tangible gold. Uh, Bitcoin, on the other hand, can be uh, much more manipulated, being just dis digital only, having tangible. I don't have to worry about that. We're seeing one of the oldest gold traders closing. Looks like Canada's Bank of Nova Scotia is exploring options for its gold business. They're looking to unwind the business 
Looks like it all came crashing down in 2018 following a historic money laundering event where there was a rehypothecation scandal that wiped out nearly 350 years of the good reputation of the bank. So we actually covered that on an earlier episode. Uh, the topic was uh, gold, dirty relic, or actual money. So there's a Netflix documentary that goes into this where a lot of that gold was purchased uh, illegally out of Peru and then went through uh, the processing system in Florida uh, for that gold to be processed. So they were part of a money laundering scheme using billions of dollars of criminally derived gold, mostly from Peru. What happened is the gold was going through these um, refineries in Florida and then the money would be sent back. So the refinery would sell it and then send the money via Nova Scotia back to Peru. But it was not part of KYC or know your customer. So the bank is supposed to know who their customer's customer is, KYCC, know your customer's customer. <laughs> I mean, this is real stuff. And so um, that's part of the problem. So they're literally going out of business. So when with that gold surge 8.5% in April, as central banks are creating infinite amounts of currency for bailouts and government spending. Gold is heading for the biggest month gain since 2016. One of those major buyers is China looking to offset uh, the US dollar's global dominance. Wayne Zenyang leads the world's largest physical spot gold exchange, said in an interview that the gold gains should be sustained, but ultimately a new kind of currency is needed. He said that future global trades need a super sovereign currency system under which no single country has the power to freeze the international asset of another country. He also goes on to say that it's been a weapon for the U.S., but a source of insecurity for other countries and that the currency the world ultimately chooses for global trade must not be one that gives someone privilege while exposing others to insecurity. Wang was also the author of a book, The Principle of Trading Economics. He didn't explain how the new currency would work, but said that it must be adapted to a post-pandemic world in which he said economic and political power would be more evenly spread, and that the global clout of the U.S. will reduce while the status of the European nation and China will rise in global affairs. So for me, it looks like precious metals are looking good. Gold and silver is looking solid, uh, as well as some cash in the mattress. There's a war on cash. So today, the largest bill is a $100 bill. It's lost about 80% of its purchase power since 1968. So it's really a $20 bill from those days. And it used to be that we would have $500 bills, $1,000, $5,000, even $10,000 bills that were issued. But a lot of that has gone to the wayside for the reasons of uh, attacks on tax evasion or terrorism or criminal activity. Cash is anonymous, so it can't be tracked. But I think the real reason is because you're seeing the elimination of cash would allow for the imposing of negative interest rates. If you can't have a bank run, then you can impose negative interest rates. So the U.S. Mint at West Point might be closing, and the Royal Canadian Mint is closed, and gold refiners in Switzerland might be closed. So if golds are not already difficult to find, it might be impossible especially as we see central bankers pick this up. So there might be six central banks that you see, including the Federal Reserve in the U.S., the European Central Bank, Bank of England, Bank of China, Bank of Japan, and the Swiss National Bank. So effectively printing unlimited amounts of money is going to bring the intrinsic value of fiat currency to zero. This is causing central banks to panic. They're creating trillions of dollars in euros and US dollars, everything. So gold and silver is not going to be the obvious winners as a currency debasement accelerates. So this chart is showing that gold is cheap today as it was in 1970. So with hyperinflation, you're going to see a few zeros added to that, but you can't use it as a tool to speculate. Gold is insurance to wealth protection. So I'm trying to increase that from 10 to 30% of my overall holdings. That may or may not be enough. I don't know. Time will tell. With that, we're going to roll this one up. I'm Josh Kincaid. This is The Talking Hedge. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Or don't. And I'm out. My name is Kira Reed, and I'd like to invite you to be inspired 
by the women who are leading in the cannabis industry. Each week, we will discuss empowerment, leadership, and what it means to be a woman in charge in marijuana, hemp, and CBD. As the founder of the Women Empowered in Cannabis community, I have had the great pleasure to get to know many brilliant and talented women who are CEOs, executives, politicians, advocates, and community leaders that are focused on creating a cannabis economy that is just, fair, and equal. We'll learn how these women make decisions, how they navigate a predominantly male industry, and what they're doing to level the playing field for women. I hope you'll join us.